afternoon, everyone. I'm uh, honored to be given the chance to, to speak on behalf of uh, the CTBTO today. CTBTO stands for the Comprehensive Nuclear Test Ban Treaty Organization. This is the second time that uh, we are invited to give a talk at the CGPM. Uh, perhaps some of you remember in 2018, my former colleague, Julien Marty, who came to this assembly to present the needs that the CTBTO has from the meteorology community. Today, four years later, I come to present the achievements, uh, major achievements that were, that were obtained. Uh, so first, what, what is the CTBT? So the CTBT is a Comprehensive Nuclear Test Ban Treaty. Uh, it prohibits all nuclear tests on Earth, regardless if they are of military or non-military purpose, and regardless of the yield. Uh, how many uh, nuclear tests were performed on Earth since, since 1945? Uh, more than 2,000. Yet, since uh, the, the treaty was opened for signature on the 24th September of 1996, only 12 tests were performed on Earth. Uh, the CTBT became a global norm to ban uh, nuclear tests, uh, and I consider this a success. Uh, since the year 2000, only one country has broken the moratorium against nuclear testing. Uh, the Preparatory Commission for the CTBT organization is tasked with building up the verification regime and promoting the treaty's universality. Uh, so why do we need a verification regime? Because we need to monitor the compliance of the member states with the treaty when it will come into force. Uh, <clears throat> for that, we need to be able to detect nuclear tests, and we have the first pillar of the verification regime, the international monitoring system, that is used to collect, analyze, and distribute data from 337 monitoring facilities. Uh, very much like in the case of the presentations by the ESA on, on Monday, uh, we have a similar need, basically our first source of information is the data we collect from the field so that we can make decisions, so this data is really important to us. Uh, yes, the verification regime is central to the treaty. Uh, how does it work? So we have uh, four different technologies that are used, uh, totaling 337 facilities. First, we have the seismic technology that is used to listen underground for nuclear explosions. Then we have 11 hydroacoustic stations to listen underwater, uh, 60 infrasound stations used to listen above ground in the atmosphere, and finally we have the radionuclide technology that is used to distinguish explosions whether they are of nu nuclear nature or not. Um, <clears throat> 90 percent of IMS faci facilities are already certified and operational today. Uh, the network has already proven its effectiveness, uh, but it is not only used to detect nuclear weapons, it's also nuclear tests, sorry. It's also used uh, for other purposes, civilian purpose, uh, to contribute to save lives and to expand scientific knowledge. For instance, the IMS data is used to contribute to tsunami warning systems, uh, but also to track nuclear releases in case of a nuclear accident, such as the one in Fukushima Daiichi, in 2011, uh, and the data of the IMS uh, network is also made available to member states and researchers who want to conduct research, for instance, on climate change. Uh, how, how do we get to metrology, or how did we get to metrology? Um, so we have four technologies, like I was saying before, uh, which combined together are meant to provide forensic evidence in case of a nuclear test. That is why the credibility of our data and of our measurement systems is absolutely essential. Uh, in order to achieve technical and scientific credibility, we need transparency, benchmarking, peer review, and a strong quality assurance system that needs to be uh, working through the full life of our measurement systems that are typically deployed for several ten decades uh, at the stations. So we have set some high-level objectives uh, in order to achieve that credibility. First is to demonstrate the quality assurance in IMS measurements to ensure the trustworthiness and the credibility of IMS data. 
second is to ensure the consistency in IMS measure measurements and equivalence in data that is produced across the IMS network. And third is to ensure the continuity and transparency of best practices, regardless of any change in the instrumentation, service providers, or individual personnel. Back to the four technologies uh, to make a statement on where we are in terms of quality assurance. So for the radionuclide technology, we already have uh, good, very good standards and uh, some processes such as proficiency testing in place and CMCs that uh, fully support uh, our current needs for particulate and noble gas uh, technologies. Uh, our main challenge today is rather with the seismic, hydroacoustic, and infrasound technologies. Uh, so in uh, 2018, uh, during the presentation to the CGPN, CGPM, uh, the, my, my former colleague, uh, Julien Marty, expressed the need for validated CMCs across the IMS monitoring range. One additional challenge is that uh, the me measurement systems that we deploy at our stations are deployed in very harsh and remote environments. It can be as far as Antarctica or the tropical forest uh, or in the desert, and they cannot be moved back to laboratories for calibration. This means that we need traceability all the way to the station. Uh, this brought us closer to the uh, meteorology uh, field and to the <coughs> collaboration with the BIPM. Uh, and it's accelerated very much since 2017. In 2017, the CTBTO was invited for the first time to give some invited presentations to the CCAUV and has taken part in the biennial strategic meetings since then. Then in 2018, like I was telling you, the CTBTO was invited to give a presentation to the CGPM and presented the IMS needs uh, to this assembly. Quickly after that, the BIPM and the CTBTO identified common goals that provide the basis for a mutually beneficial relationship. And finally, the CTBTO traceability needs were included in strategy document of the Consultative Committee for Acoustic, Ultrasound and Vibrations, but also for ionized radiations. Um, so what happened after that is that in June 2021, uh, the existing collaboration at technical level that was already very intense was officialized uh, through the signature of a practical arrangement between the BIPM and the CTBTO, which uh, makes uh, the CCAUV and the CCRI official, uh, now official liaisons of the CTBTO. Uh, now the question is how do we turn strategy, the strategy that was written in the, by, by these consultative committees, into projects and uh, actual work? Uh, so, the metro how, how does the metrology community capture the low-frequency AUV needs? Uh, the Euramet research project Infra AUV 2020 to 2023 is capturing uh, the needs that were expressed by the CTBTO. Uh, it is uh, particular in the sense that the 10 participants of that project are a mix of NMIs and of uh, service providers of the international monitoring system, meaning that the uh, progress that is done through that project is very quickly felt uh, in terms of our work. Uh, what are the objectives of the project? It is to extend the frequency range for traceable environmental measurements in the field of infrasound, underwater acoustics, and seismic vibration to lower frequencies. This can be done through the development of calibration methods, procedures for validation and dissemination, and on-site transfer to actual applications at measurement stations. So it's this third, this third objective that is very much of a challenge in the sense of uh, bringing the traceability all the way to the stations. Uh, so since two years that the project started, we have a very close collaboration uh, between CTBTO seismoacoustic experts and both the CCAUV and the infra AUV. Now I will uh, go a little bit more into the detail in terms of the progress per technology. So I, I presented to you a little bit earlier in this presentation that we have uh, three major technologies uh, that are uh, concerned by this presentation. 
the infrasound, seismic, and hydroacoustic. Starting with the infrasound, uh, in 2018, the, the, a very similar slide was, was shown to this assembly, showing that there was no validated CMCs for a good part of the infrasound monitoring range, which ranges from uh, 0.02 hertz to 4 hertz. Uh, well, the infra AUV uh, captures this, this need. Uh, this implies a particular focus on working with new instruments. Uh, typically, in, in the past, when it came to, to, to the acoustic domain, uh, we were thinking rather in terms of uh, measuring static pressure, which was uh, done through the usage of barometers or audible sounds uh, or low frequency uh, pressure variations that were done through microphones, but now we need to, to cover the part that is in between. And that part, uh, for our applications, we use microbarometers, uh, which are quite different devices from microphones, meaning that we need to have uh, new methods to, to calibrate those so that we can use them as, as transfer standards. So uh, calibration concepts are being developed based on different principles. So we have many participants, uh, many, many NMIs and IMS service providers that develop their own concept based on different principles. And the good news is that uh, through the cooperation of the project Infra AUV, several comparisons are already being organized that show a good agreement, a good agreement among all these principles and concepts of calibration. So this gives good hope to have uh, quickly CMCs to, to cover uh, the, the, the part of the range that is currently not covered. Continuing on the infrasound technology, so I just said that uh, primary and secondary comparisons were organized under the Infra AUV project. Another interesting uh, development that is happening is also to bring the traceability to the site. And on that, we have, again, a very close collaboration with the Infra AUV project whereby uh, software is being developed by the CTBTO to bring the calibration all the way to the stations based on a methodology uh, described by Tom Gabrielson. Uh, and what is a, a great collaboration, I mean, what makes a good, great collaboration is that this development is supported by the Infra AUV project through software contributions so that we can have a expanded uncertainty brought all the way to the field. So traceability to the field. Uh, another great progress over the past four years is that we have uh, two new uh, standards, or rather one that was revised for primary microphone calibration by reciprocity, which was brought to lower frequency and cover our range. And second is the creation of a new standard that allows for alternate calibration methods that is better suited for infrasound, meaning that, so not reciprocity, it's a standard that allows to, re to, to receive new methods that will uh, allow to more easily uh, calibrate microbarometers. And finally, we have uh, good hope that the first CMCs, which are currently in preparation, will be submitted very shortly to the BIPM, meaning that we will, uh, this will have been a, a, very, a very fast journey uh, to having the first CMCs. Now, uh, the metrology applied by the CTBTO community. So one major uh, takeout of this collaboration is not just the, the development of CMCs and the, the progress made by the metrology community, but it is also all what we learn from the metrology community uh, in, in terms of CTBTO and the community of uh, organizations that work with the CTBT, CTBTO. Uh, so since 2014, a lot has been done uh, with IMS service providers to better understand uh, concepts such as, for instance, uh, VIM, the vocabulary uh, for, for metrology, uh, the, the GOOM, the guide for uncertainty measurement. All of these, these concepts and these, uh, these, these things that are probably very, very, uh, very much in your daily work were not so well known uh, in our field. And uh, now there is really some big progress in this field. And this was, uh, this was possible thanks to the organization of pilot studies with the main IMS service providers, such as Sandia National Laboratories, the Commiss Commissariat Energie Atomique, Penn State University, the Los Alamos uh, National Laboratories, the University of Mississippi, and Acoustic Sensor Networks. Uh, all this could have a fruitful co 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 cooperation and knowledge exchange 
which led to better understand, understand concepts such as what is a measure end, what is an uncertainty budget, uh, how to develop methodologies that are valid from a meteorological perspective, what is the effect of the environment on our sensors. Uh, and this led in 2021 to the first CTBTO comparison, so a comparison organized by CTBTO in the IMS infrasound monitoring range. Uh, so that comparison involves some of the actors that you saw on the previous slide. So we have fi five participants. Uh, what is great is that our pilot, the Laboratoire National d'Etalonnage, which is an NMI, so that can bring us a lot of the, of the, inform like the, of the methods that uh, we, we need, and so they can guide us through the process of comparison. Uh, the measure end is uh, the pressure sensitivity, from 0.01 hertz to 10 hertz, which is more than the IMS infrasound monitoring range. And we work uh, with three different types of sensors covering uh, from barometers, which typically are used for static pressure, microbarometer to bridge the gap between uh, static pressure and audible sound, and microphones. It is the first time that the capability of IMS service providers is formally assessed. And uh, the good news is that, I mean, today we have a draft A report of this comparison that is already being circulated to the, to, to the participants. And we can already say that the, the equivalence is demonstrated for the majority of the frequency range. So looking forward now, uh, we are uh, going to extend our efforts in the infrasound, but also to look towards the seismic technology and hopefully organize also comparisons in the, for the seismic technology. So now I, this makes a nice transition to the progress on seismic technology. Uh, again, a part of the IMS seismic monitoring range is not covered by, uh, is by validated CMCs. This is also addressed by the infra AUV project. Uh, one of the main challenges of the, for the seismic technology is that we, the current metrology benches, workbenches at NMIs are usually uh, built to support only accelerometers um, calibration. And these are quite light instruments, whereas the instruments that we work with, which are uh, meant to, to monitor lower frequencies, are have a response that is flat to velocity and are typically much heavier. So it means it, it requires some uh, significant uh, adap adapting of the workbench at NMIs. Uh, but also there is uh, some efforts that are put by the infra AUV project to develop uh, methods so that we can maintain the traceability again to the deployed sensors on site. And here you can see a few calibration concepts and methods that are under development at NMIs and IMS service providers in the IMS passband. And then the last technology, the hy hydroacoustic. Uh, so on this, we have no validated CMCs over the whole uh, IMS hydroacoustic monitoring range. Uh, but we have significant progress also on this technology because uh, we have a first calibration concept that covers the full IMS monitoring range that, is, uh, that has been developed by the NPL. Uh, so we have good hopes that uh, this will uh, bring quickly CMCs. And the second thing is that we have uh, a real challenge with on-site calibration because these hydroacoustic stations are uh, microphones that are deployed about one kilometer below the surface of the ocean in the SOFAR channel. So they are very difficult to access. It's very costly to bring, for instance, a reference microphone and deploy it next to the, to the, to the station. Uh, so research is ongoing and we have, uh, again, a close collaboration between uh, the CTBTO and the CCAUV and the Infra AUV project uh, for that. Uh, here, if I can outline one picture uh, out of all these calibration concepts, it would be the, the third one from the, from the left, uh, which is the NPL uh, calibration concept I was just mentioning that uh, is covering our full monitoring range. So now looking forward, uh, what can we hope from, uh, from the future and from uh, this collaboration with the BIPM? 
First, uh, all this progress will need to be disseminated to the whole CTBTO community, all the way to the operators of the stations who have ultimately to, to calibrate the stations. Uh, the CTBTO will continue to collaborate also with IMS service providers so that uh, we can address the need for traceability all the way to the station. Uh, I have to say that this is quite a challenge also in terms of uh, making this, opera like this, this uh, process operational so that we describe results of calibration, associated uncertainties, means that we are used to process the data and document it for reproducibility. This is a challenge that, that I think is very close to, to what was described several times during this, uh, this, this uh, CGPM uh, with regards to the digital era where we need to define formats to describe our results, uh, to allow for reproducibility, to describe how we are going to distribute this. Uh, this has impact also on uh, defining interfaces between us and our uh, member states. And finally, uh, the sensors are deployed in very harsh environments for their whole lifetime. So in the future, what we would uh, very much like is to, to continue to collaborate with the BIPM so that we can better understand the sensors in service. But also, uh, we would like to, to, to better characterize the impact of the environment, for, for instance, temperature, humidity, on sensor characteristics. So to conclude, uh, the meteorological traceability for IMS measurements is key to further increase the trust and to sustain the credibility in IMS data in the long term. Then the CTBTO has raised awareness of these needs and the good news is that we have a strong response from the meteorological community. The BIPM and the CTBTO are working on common goals and within a formal practical arrangements already providing, proving to be mutually a beneficial relationship. Uh, then the international meteorological community has already started to work on extending its measurement and calibration capabilities towards lower frequencies, letting us hope for uh, soon submission even of CMCs. And finally, with the current rate of progress within a decade, we can hope that most requirements will be already fulfilled for the seismic and the acoustic technologies. So thank you very much. <laughs>